In a recent video, we were talking about the Borromean rings and the role they play in the new logo of the International Math Mathematical Union. Sometimes I say International Mathematicians Union. I often make mistakes. So notice the three phi rectangles mutually perpendicular to each other in that picture. I have this similar thing going on in my numeracy series, which is a four-part from the 90s, but still current, a four-part sharing of the Oregon Curriculum Network curriculum. In other words, we call it the Oregon Curriculum Network because it has a curriculum that makes kind of a network. And it's not like this train goes everywhere. It's this train goes places where you can then get another train to something else. But it goes a lot of places. Like I did have a quaternion driven rotating cube in perspective here, but Java applets kind of fell by the wayside. So that no longer pops up. So down here in the middle of the page is where I'm headed. We've got the phi rectangles again. And there are corresponding squares you could think of that make the cube octahedron. So when you do the jitterbug, you can think in terms of these mutually perpendicular planes, basically three orthogonal planes. And if you're doing X, Y, Z, then this is a great segue, right? We're not trying to get away from three mutually orthogonal somethings or other. We still have that, and it's still important, and one, way, one place to find it that's important is in the symmetry of the icosahedron. Now the next way to jump into this material is through Kepler. I would say Kepler and sphere packing, because Kepler, again, is a grand central station to so many other destinations. So when you get to sphere packing, you needn't limit it to Kepler's conjecture, which is what you'll find a lot about, but just why was he even making such conjectures? Well, he was interested in sphere packing. And the thing is, Fuller's concentric hierarchy looks a lot like where Kepler was going. Let's see, what is this search? It's obviously searched on something here. So yeah, as we get closer to the top, I'm seeing a lot more of my graphics. For a while, I was doing the uh, compression or the aspect ratio incorrectly. Russell Towell showed me how to do it right. So like that, I cost he a little bit squashed. I haven't gone back and fixed those ones. This one too, I'd say it's a bit on the squash side. This is my early technique for exploring geometry a la synergetics. Use Python or FoxPro. Some use a computer language to write scene description language, which you then render using POV Ray. So it's a free software pipeline to some pretty good graphics, right? So it's affordable to somebody such as myself. So sphere packing the three mutually uh, intersecting rectangles, and then. Here's the thing, when you're packing these spheres, you're often, by the way, going to come across cannonballs as if many of us ever see that sort of packing cannonballs. But let's put that in as a search term anyway. Stacking cannonballs. So that takes, this is a pretty interesting picture, just the number of cannonballs in that picture. It just implies infinite ammo, doesn't it? And it's making interesting use of perspective. But the point to make on the cannonball packing story is you can start with the square base, as we're doing here, and then just build up layer by layer, square, 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 square. And that's what we're talking about in this uh, video that you can start with triangular layer, in which case, though, you have more valleys to nest your next level in than you need or can use with same size spheres. So there's an ambivalence that's introduced or an ambiguity when you start <clears throat> with your, your triangles. <clears throat> Whereas the, the square packing is a more rigid 
there's only one way to do it next layer up you don't have choice if you play by certain rules whatever I mean so there we go so that's starting with a square base and building up but then you can start with a triangular base and build up like I say and if you make the right choices you end up with the same spheres right you end up with the same packing square based or triangular based and this is important and interesting math you don't have to get it from this curriculum it's just this is a very important uh, station stop on our subway system so then if you want to jump on our subway and visit our topics the way we do it fine and good you're welcome to do that and and then get off somewhere in another part of math or engineering or philosophy or literature in other words our aim is to give you an interesting airline you could say a network of short flights that can get you all over the place. So let me glue that all together for you a little bit. It's the three intersecting rectangles of the, well actually the C60 is, and Flex Tegrity in general are the best examples of this because they don't they don't all touch the balls. So the balls are in their rhombic dodecahedral domains but we don't let them grow to be so big that they actually touch each other. They don't actually touch each other and therefore we can treat them like floating <clears throat> icosahedrons. And the soccer ball has the icosahedral uh, symmetry in it being a hexapent. <clears throat> so what C60 does is it takes advantage of the three-way <clears throat> weaving of X, Y, and Z sort of uh, passageways. There's, there's, when you build an IVM, you don't give up or sacrifice that you want to have mutually orthogonal pathways. And what you see in C60 here are three mutually perpendicular sets of sort of X, Y pathways that go in a pl they're vertical to each other like a skyscraper it's like these are the floors of a skyscraper in the way you would expect a skyscraper to be you know just x y planes and the balls are fitting that because as we're looking down here this is kind of the squaresville packing and the fact that the balls don't fill all space is deliberate of course but there could be a rhombic dodecahedral sort of fence around each one that would touch and that would show how big the balls would have to be to actually be intertangent, to actually touch each other. But we don't let them touch each other. We keep them small enough so that we can treat them like icosahedra and grip onto the ends of these three phi rectangles. Like our, our uh, railways, they keep these things steady and compressed are <clears throat> grabbing sort of at 90 degrees or off times kind of at a slanting degrees in a way that pulls in and pulls back sometimes. There's a lot of interesting tension compression and that's you know that's what Sam is best in understanding because he puts his things under enormous pressure and, and stress and gets a lot out of that so all right so that was all about diving into, in a way, this gallery experience. We're about to have a sort of exhibit about this whole idea of lattices. And to get there, if you want to join the Oregon Curriculum Network sort of subway system, what I'm suggesting is jumping in through sphere packing in general as your topic and start with Kepler and his interest in that topic and go through the phi rectangles and then really dive into phi a lot too. Not just in the terms of Fibonacci and phi. There's a lot more to phi like here, the icosahedron and phi. That's a good place. Or just pentagons and phi. And, uh, and we'll see you back here.